Bien. So, now we are going to continue with our panel. Geopolitics is a passionate, disrupted topic, and we will start, and we hope that you continue as active and interested as you did during the first part. I give the floor to Colonel Fernando Barrero, our moderator. Thank you, my Colonel Rojas. I am pleased to be here with you. And Dr. Ruben Useche, director of the Colombia Diplomatic uh, Academy, Augusto Ramirez Ocampo. Augusto Ramirez Ocampo was a great major of Bogota and an excellent chancellor. Magister in Diplomacy, Certificate on Diplomatic Studies, MLLD, Magister on uh, Foreign Affairs, GMAP, uh, School of Love and Diplomatic, apologize for my English, funded by the Harvard University and Tufts, Tufts University, located in Boston metropolitan area, Massachusetts State, United States. Dr. Useche graduated in legal science, lawyer, and doctor in jurisprudence from the Catholic University of Ecuador consultant, highlighting the most important activities directing the uh, Boston College master degree. He, the lecture of Dr. Useche, civil military relationships. Welcome, welcome to all the attendees to the lecture hall and to all those who are attending virtually. The floor is yours, Dr. Useche. Colonel, can you hear me? Yeah, good morning, good morning, everyone. Special greetings. General Luis Fernando Fuentes, Dean of the Nueva Granada University, and all the generals, colonels, and other members of the Colombian Armed Forces who are with us today. All the students, a special greeting. Also, I appreciate very much the Colonel Pedro Rojas and all the members of uh, AOD for this inv invitation to share with you some reflections about the civilian-military relationships as a boost to the Colombian di diplomacy. I want to start with some reflection. October 7, 19, 18, 1921, first executive decree of the new government of Colombia where created the Foreign Affairs Secretariat and, War and Maritime Secretariat and these two ministries were two important pillars for the Colombian state. And this year, we are in the 200 years of our creation, and that's why I invited you to give the context of how important these two state functions are. The relationship between the armed services and foreign policy are therefore established since the state was born, 1821, giving the strong to close with saying that war is the continuation of politics through different means. International study shows the deep link between legitimate violence and state building. Boosted to the paroxysm by United States sociologist Charles Tillett and the polemic paper of 1885 to do the war and build the state as an organized crime. From our res diplomatic responsibilities, we try to avoid to reach to the last resource, that's war. However, it is important to recognize the management of the legitimate violence is an integral part of the state building. The same definition of the state proposed by German sociologist Max Weber is confronted about the relationship between power and violence saying that the monopoly of the legitimate violence is what characterized the state. In the other so German sociologist, Norbert Elias, developed this claim defining the state in function of the law of monopolies, identifying the four main interests of the state, the territorial, territorial monopoly, legitimate force, uh, fiscal monopoly and the judicial monopoly. Legitimate violence is always present in the social logical analysis when building a state. And of course, 
bounded to the notion or the building of the figure of the citizen. Weren't the troops of the Freedom Army who allowed us to acquire our citizenship? Is not the war against the coalition, Austro-Prussian coalition, which allowed to develop the French nationality feeling to defend the recently created country just created by the citizens? War and actors somehow are part of the base that allowed to an international scale build the state nations. Maybe in a cartoon type, Ernest Gardner was saying that it is the nationalism what creates the nation, armed forces and foreign policy are the pillars of the Colombian institutionality. And I would like to make emphasis yep. of this conference, getting away of the theoretical initial consideration to go and talk about the foreign policy articulation with the representatives of our armed forces through the diplomacy specifically the role of our military attaches in the foreign nations. I would like to break out the image disclosed around the world that the military attache is a gun seller around the world and try to show here that both pillars created in 1821 need to work together representing the Colombian state around the world and working for the diplomacy and the common values that encourage us. The military at the chair role beyond the wrong images of selling guns needs to be focused in the next aspect. The cooperation, bilateral relationships, certification to learn and to share experiences to improve the image of Colombia around the world and the intelligence. The political learning on how to use the force articulating the Ministry of Defense were it for the soft power that the state has. Represent the state of our rod in the maximum expression as ambassador or military attache precisely is how to manage the soft power of the legitimate violence. All everyone covered un, under the dome of the foreign service. Those military-civilian relationships keeps up to the date an inter-administrative agreement between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Colombia and the Superior School of War under the framework where some officers of the Colombian Chancellor's Office may receive training in the DEGA and these services as colonels can be trained in the CAMI courses to provide their services later on as military attaches. During my short presence in Colombia, after coming back last month of June, we were able to open and close in presence the coming curses of 2021. I prepare some words that come from the bottom of my heart because under the framework of both acts, the first thing we did was to sing the national anthem out loud. Tears of joy were around my face. And that wasn't done since many years back. And what best than in the Superior College of War, homaging the soldiers of my country who are giving everything, even their lives, to protect us, all the Colombians. That's how can a life can be more heroic than those who give the life for others? During my presence in the Colombian Academy, the Diplomatic Colombian Academy, Augusto Ramirez Ocampo, I had the opportunity to research, and I found the fact that the house where our main site is had different uses before. Even General Jose Maria Cordova bought it to live there. He couldn't do it, but I know that his spirit is still there because the link between the military world and the diplomatic one was sealed since 1821, and it needs to continue for 200 more years. And that's the reason why I want to tell you that the Diplomatic Academy is also your house. The academic cooperation among 
both schools and both ministries need to be always together. And now also with the military university in Nueva Granada, with whom we are starting a new cooperation that I hope that will last for more years. It is not a coincidence that the current deputy president and chancellor Marta Lucia Ramirez was also Ministry of Defense, and not also a coincidence that the doors of this venue were open to share with you some short reflections about the civil-military relationships as an accelerant of the Colombian diplomacy, and together we can explore other cooperation paths. I'm talking about the importance of these relationships, again, as a boost, because we cannot continue each as different silos. On the contrary, we need to work more closer than ever. The mission of the Colombian state and the welfare of all the Colombians living high so we can go deeper in the cooperation among the members of the armed services and the diplomats so together we can defend Colombia from any enemy. General Cordova soul is living in the academy and in the same way I hope that the soul will live here in this military university in Nueva Granada because those who were before us, the leaders from heaven, are there waiting that we won't destroy their legacy. In this diplomatic work, we are invited to talk with everyone, to attend the bridges, and also to send a firm, strong message when this is needed. The former Secretary of the United Nations of Yunnan said, that if war is the failure of diplomacy, then the bilateral, multilateral diplomacy is the first line of defense. Nowadays, we need to retake those words and together build a foreign service of Colombia articulated when there is no fear or discussions among the members of the same Band. We need to be more Colombians than ever, and that means cohesion and more communication. A few days ago, from this world, left one of the world leaders who was in high commands in both worlds, the military and the diplomatic general Colin Power from the United States, who also was state secretary. It means that he was a chancellor. I had the fortune to have a Dean in Fletcher Admiral James Tabridish, who was com Supreme Commander at NATO and the first Admiral to be it, to do, to do so. He recently wrote about two work share, two hours share with Powell before us accepting his naming at NATO. Dr. Powell words to Stavridis were, remember who you are, Stavridis. You haven't been sent there to be the Carlo Magno of 21st century. Be optimist and also be humble. Talk with everyone. Talk to everyone and learn the other's story. We live, give four guides. Hum, humbleness, connectivity, empathy, and optimism. Where else can we find those qualities if it's not in the Colombian soldier, the professional soldier that shall never for, should never forget where he's coming from. So when he is in high positions and missions in Colombia and in the world, he will continue with these four guidelines given by uh, uh, Powell to Sabrina. It's a soldier, an our soldier of Colombia serving from the diplomatic academy. Augusto Ramirez Ocampo is an honor to me. I'm very proud to be here in the military University of Nueva Granada sharing with you these reflections. I am sure that both uh, forces are always going to be working together to defend Colombia uh, that for our children and the new generations. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Lucia. Ya llegará el tiempo para las preguntas. Quiero darle la bienvenida al senador Edgar Palacio. 
I want to welcome Mr. Edgar Palacio. And before your intervention, I want to introduce Mr. Henry Cancelado Franco. He's a politologist from the National University of Colombia with a master's in analysis of political, economic problems, and contemporary international relations from Externado University in Colombia and the Higher Institute of Studies for Latin America in Paris. He has an uh, honors uh, cause a... Uh, degree on intelligence and counterintelligence from the National Army of Colombia. He was director of the intelligence school at the National Directorate of Intelligence. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Los Andes. He was dean of the humanitarian school. He's a graduate. I'm sorry, he's clearly not reading. Um, can, can be understood. So after this confusion of, uh, of pages I've had, I apologize, but I am pleased to introduce Mr. Edgar Palacio Misari, currently a senator member of the Third Economic Commission and the Human Rights Commission of the Senate of the Republic, of which he was president. He was also, he also chaired and founded the Child Commission on Childhood and the Political Allies of the State of Israel. He's a university professor in philosophy, theology, political science, and international relations for over 20 years in different universities in the country. Honorable Senator Palacios is a theologist from the Theological Seminar in Colombia, and he has an honorary scholar, a PhD. You have the floor. We are in this conference in person and online. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize because I'm a little bit late. But while we're here, I want to thank um, you for the invitation to share this reflection in, in such an, a fundamental space for the relations between Israel and Colombia. Any analysis uh, we may want to do of the relations between the Israel and Colombia states implies a conceptual analysis on the nature of the state as an institution. So I will start with some epistemological premises on the nature of the state to then address the relationship between the state of Israel and the state of Colombia. That is why this reflection is entitled Relations Between Israel and Colombia, and it's the state is here to stay. First, all states are founded from the dispossession of land by force. And the state is born from war and for warfare. In, from the Westphalia peace in 1648, when it acquires legitimate monopoly of force. I mean... Since then, warfare is not done by the tribes and clans and families that was before 1648, but the coercion, power of coercion is born through the state. There is a dual nature of the state. It is both coercion and consensus. So based on that, I want to analyze the relationship between these two states. So with the Westphalia peace, that was a, a treaty that put an end to a 30-year-long war before, there were different entities that uh, waged war, cities, monarchs, and um, a state, I understand, as an axiom, as a dogma. It needs no justification. National security is the reason of the state. Here, we need to see how the state is understood so that we can understand the enemies 
of the state. So if, if the state is born in the 17th century and strengthened in the 18th and 19th centuries as the European states, and I, I clarify, a state is a, a, a Western invention. It's born in the West, but it has an Eastern roots from the close East in the case of uh, Judeo-Christian culture, that from Palestine uh, gives rise to what we talk as the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. And when we talk about globalization, we are talking about globalizing the values, principles, and the cosmic vision, or, or uh, the view of the universe and or the world, and to sort of export it to other places in the planet. So. Professor Huntington in his book talks about this when talking about the clash of civilizations, this major final confrontation that we will be seeing in this West against the East or East against the West. Professor Fukuyama uh, from Harvard University in his book, The End of History, also upholds a thesis, the fact that we should consider the end of history and the, the last man. The end of history is that the confrontation after the Cold War, after the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, mm. so after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the uh, uh, decay of the influence of the former USSR, in the countries was reducing, being reduced as to the point where Euro communism in Western Eastern Europe crumbled down. We see that a vacuum appears, and in this vacuum, Fukuyama says that it's at the end of history, a Hegelian uh, idea that there are some winners and there are some losers. But from that perspective, I'm also addressing the analysis of the situation where I do consider that Western democracy ends up imposing itself in the world. So we need to see what is geopolitic about in order to address this analysis. I very quickly uh, synthesized just one nation, as Karl Hofer said in 1934 in his book, or sorry, at, at the Institute, Next slide, please. <laughs> Professor Karl Hoshofer, in 1934, who was a German uh, general and director of the Institute of Geopolitical Studies at the Munich University, said, only a nation whose space is in agreement with its needs, both material and spiritual, can ever have hope of reaching true greatness. Next, please. It is science, a uh, summary, it is science of geopolitics that conceives state as a geographical organism or as a phenomenon in space. It understands state as a living organism that is expressed in the territory, the people, its economy, society, and government. It also studies relations between the land and political institutions. Then uh, Professor Rudolf Kellen, uh, Swedish politician and uh, politologist, we see the, the state as a way of life in his work. And he defined geopolitics as the influence of geographical factors in the broadest sense or meaning of the word in the development of the life of peoples and states. So here we have... Uh, sort of equation, function, politics in function of geography, where politics is the dependent variable and geography is the independent variable. So politics is defined uh, in uh, based on the geographical factors of the state and the influence of the medium on political action. This is important because in order to talk about this relationship or relation between uh, Israel and Colombia, we could 
do it in, a, in two ways. One approach from the state, conceiving it as the creation of the law, that is the, the sort of legal vision that implies that the Constitution is the essential standard for the state. But this falls short. There's a reductionism there. I like the second way of looking at the state better, which is mainly power, the vision of power, and the law must be subordinated to it. Undoubtedly, law is the grammar of power. That is why our constitution is called constitu political constitution and not legal or juridical constitution. The, juridic, the judicial, the juridical comes from the political. That is essential to understand why the state of Israel and the Colombian state are autonomous, but also why the state of Israel has a right to be a Jewish state, which was then uh, um, and up for uh, um, controversy. But we, we, it could be seen from a, a xenophobe or discriminatory perspective. There is a big discussion there, but the only vibrant democracy there is Israel. And so it's important to understand that the nation state comes precisely from the identity of a people, culture, beliefs, values, traditions, religion, and all that influenced the creation of the state of Israel. Not all the people, such as the Kurdish, have managed to achieve an, a state of their own. So the ju juridical or legal comes from the political. The political science is then the science of power. It's subject study is power. Law looks at it from a legal perspective, but geopolitics looks at the state as a living being that develops, that grows, that expands. This thesis we've seen in the Nazi invasions and trying to justify this with the need for a vital space. And that's important because the borders of countries, as in the case of Israel, the border defining conflicts with Gaza, with Syria, um, sorry, with um, Egypt and all surrounding actors, there is a conflict there because some are claiming their own territory also. That is why I started with the thesis that all states are based on the dispossession of land. It is not an issue particularly for Israel. In Colombia, too, during the colonial times, farmers and indigenous peoples were dispossessed of their land. And, and until today, it remains a point for the Havana Peace Accords. So who does the land in Colombia belong to? So there are some common elements, both for the state of Israel and for the Colombian state the issue of land. It is not as, as specific to Israel, uh, this problem. So a man can lead a satisfactorily decent life with no family, with no place of residence or religion. But that man is nothing without the state. That is why it is important to preserve the state as an institution. And that was just, I entitled this, the state is here to stay. If you have no state, you lack guarantees and you lack rights. You have no certainty on land outside the framework of an organized state. And there's a book on the medieval origins of the modern state. This is also fundamental because it allows us to understand that how could it possibly be solved for the colonial state, but also for the state of Israel, the, the Jewish problem. It would be work, worked out with a state. The Kurdish are a nation, but they are uh, scattered across several states, but they have no autonomy. They just have their uh, identity as a people, their traditions, but they have no state. So without a state, human existence is not possible in the civilized modern human world. And these are some other topics. This is the nature of the state. Antonio Gramsci, philosopher, pol politician, and sociologist understood the other facet of the state, the state as consensus. This is an Italian communist that understood the power of the ruling class is not maintained only through force, through coercion, but there's a law, economy, the productive apparatus, the means of production, and of course, the political power. So the political class plus the legal 
setting, that would be the ideological superstructure, uh, as said in the Marxist theory, to remain in power. So Gramsci said that we could not understand the state simply as coercion with the prisons and for those who dissented in society, but there was also an influence or consensus stemming from educational control, religion, and the media. Understanding a culture is the main battlefield of political struggle. This takes us to the concept of nation, which is an account created in the last century to respond to who we are, being a political discourse that makes it a political movement. And the state represents the nation. This happened with Israel. This has happened with Colombia. And this has not happened with the uh, Kurdish. The concept of state terrorism, Israel has been accused of state terrorism. Colombian state has also been accused of being a terrorist, of killing civilians, of training our armed uh, forces and the military and uh, killing and, or with the doctrine of the internal enemy that they, they are said to have orders of attacking civilians, defenseless civilians. So there is no state terrorism as a crime. I mean, there need be a law first for there to be a crime. So state terrorism is not a crime because the most sovereign in the geopolitical world is the state. And Very of these perspectives are legal in nature. There's no criminal law that includes a typified uh, conduct that blames a state. And if this conduct is not typified, then the, 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 the crime of terrorism of state doesn't exist. The state, by consensus, has the legitimate monopoly of the use of force. What is common between the two states, Israel and Colombia, that both are suffering a third, fourth generation war? Society, is, uh, after the Westphalia peace, the state was facing another another state in the battlefield. But today, our armed forces in both scenarios, Israel and Colombia, are not facing another army, uniformed army, on the battlefield because the war against the state, uh, uh, both Israel and Colombia as states, its threats are not necessarily located in weapons and the use of violence, but as the Marxists said, the state has the monopoly of violence, but we respond with violence too. That is why there are armed groups and there are terrorist groups that are armed and use drug traffic as the means of sustenance. And there are two common elements between the colonial state and the state of Israel. And the fact that today the Middle East conflict is, is close to us. It's in Latin America, in Venezuela, uh, uh, Hezbollah or Hamas cells that use Colombian uh, drug traffic schemes to fund terrorist groups and express political ideas and disagreement with the existence of and birth of the state of Israel. So there's a, a hemispheric security setting where the um, Israel and Colombian states have the drug traffic as a source of destabilization for both states. So we have a threat that is beyond Colombia, such as international drug trafficking. So the Colombian state is currently under uh, ideological and geopolitical attack of a hybrid fourth and fifth generation war guided by a, a Marxist anarchist theory that views the capitalist state as its enemy has the mission to destroy. In the fourth generation war is that in which the state has lost monopoly of a war and it was transferred to state. So it's not a war between armies in a battlefield, but now there is political war, legal war, economic, social, and cultural war, and diplomatic war. So uh, one of the professors was just sharing the importance of diplomacy. So, well, we try to avoid armed conflicts through diplomacy. That's fundamental, but it's also used as a mechanism if uh, the dialogue and consensus or political agreements don't operate. Then we can try to find some economic pressure, such as China does with the information on indebtedness to submit countries, not by uh, invading states as such, but in fact, um, obtaining a percentage of economy through, uh, through loans that end up being unpayable. And China ends up 
dominating a state through business, such as in the case of Colombia, six to seven percent of foreign investment in Colombia is Chinese, and the case of the Bogota metro, and so you start seeing more Chinese people around. So it would seem to be something very business-like, very economical, but but it's a truly a fourth generation war, an economic war that includes strategic minerals, includes uranium and uh, rare lands and um, other elements important for technology development in Colombia that we have in, in, Am in the Amazon region. So we start seeing how both Israel and Colombia need to have a closer relationship in terms of science and technology because the greatest capital of Israel is its people, its innovation, is the human resource. It has no economic resources, no land resources, or that are natural resources, it has water is scarce, but its weakness has become its strength. They've been able to live, they've been able to overcome as a state that uh, despite all the opposition worldwide, and however, knowledge has helped them position themselves in military issues, aerospatial issues, and so forth. But we are complementary economies. We have just signed an agreement and uh, a free trade agreement with Colombia and Israel, and this free trade agreement allows for a strengthening of the relationship between two states that have common threats, uh, drug traffic terrorists, and the, the experience of one can and should experience the other. So, um, I don't know if those who, someone asked before if the anti-missile skull can be useful. Yeah, of course. Or drones, or neighbors, in case of Venezuela, that's a potential threat against us due to the Russians and so on. To export that revolution to Colombia, this is stabilizing the Colombian state. And if we have enough batteries, anti-air batteries or missiles, so therefore the national budget for the next government will need to start thinking in the national security, how we're going to do. And that's for us, key Israel, because they have all the expertise in terms of Air Force. They have been working also with the Columbia. We have some of their aircraft. So we can create our own aerospace industry for national security matters in terms of technology, trying to keep uh, uh, a launching base. Israel has their own launching base so we can learn from Israel and to do the te trans transfer of technology. We are already... We are already trading coffee, coal, but also we can receive and invite different Israel entrepreneurs to come to Colombia to invest here and to have some public-private partnerships in terms of the, with the state. So that is a broad free trade agreement of last generation that will help us to strengthen these bonds. And that's the first step. President Duque is going to go there to open the trade office, commercial office, to um, concrete this agreement. And we also need to strengthen the political relation, making political decisions in the Colombian state to strengthen our relationships with Israel. And we are the main partners in Latin America, I think, really. And also we have many common things. And in terms of recognizing Jerusalem as the capital, So the political position at the international level that Jerusalem is the capital, historical, archaeological proven, the capital is not a, an ideology or something of politics. It's a historical fact, 1,200, 1,200 before our age when the United Kingdom was there, when two kingdoms were uh, unified under King David. There was a state sovereign state back then. Not that Israel is now stealing land from, no, that's history. So we need to understand the present, and for that we need to understand the past. When Islam appears, and it's too late, Christianism is a sect, um, no, not, not, not with disrespect, no. Is with different theological difference of what was the Messiah. So historically, Judaism 
is the um, original matrix, not just in the with regards to the land position, also in ideological things, justice, equality, solidarity were created as uh, the base for the Jewish Christian uh, origins and. We, we have that in here, here, from there, and we have uh, the radical like Hamas, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda. They understand Israel as small Satan and the United States as the big Satan. And when you have that uh, label, you're saying that they're saying that you're the enemy. And the Western is the enemy of all these terrorist groups that are on destabilizing both states that are also present in Guajira and in other regions of this country. So we have common enemies against our states and common factors fighting against terrorism. And also we have the potential of development and to share because we are complementary technologies that technologies developed by Israel. Fifth generation war is without limits. No matter if you win or lose, you need to demolish the intellectual force of the enemy, forcing them to um, to surrender. And it's a direct manipulation of the mind, fake news, the media, uh, anti-hegemonic speech, the hegemonic speech of the capitalism through education and the means. Now, this is the other word, and that's what the means are doing when there is any information about Israel here in Colombia. They're not telling the whole story. They're just saying that Israel is a terrorist state, that bomba vessel with humanitarian aid for the Palestinians, but no one tells that they were with weapons inside the vessels. So and when they are exposed, uh, soldier, and they are with an underage Shall I shoot or not? That's a psychological war. And she's a, and that who was responsible to recruit him in the transhumanitarian rights? So our soldiers end up in jail, human law abusers, and they have a small peasant victim recluded, a friend who was against the gorilla. He told me about the psychological impact, but he was carrying the fossil. Um, what can we do in this type of war to the civil society? And they have been ideologized, manipulated, and, and, and turned as slaves. So, same in the political world. It's going the same. What they try to do with the Israel state, delegitimizing that state through the media. So, we need to be more uh, fair. When I was a senator, I presented a proposal to create the political partners of Israel state. They were saying, what do you mean with political partners? Why don't you write something softer? And how much, what's, the, what's the problem? What's the issue? What's the issue? Colombia have many po po political partners. Israel is a political partner, just not economically speaking, but also a political partner. So we need to to be very well oriented. We need to understand who is really our enemy, how they are attacking. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to survive as states. Now, talking about technology, that's very fundamental in terms of security, the agricultural development, doing the different transfers like the free trade agreement. We need to strengthen that relation with the civil society, cultural topics. That's also important. And I think that Colombia, uh, in the dipl diplomacy, of, uh, has, uh, will have a coherent relationship in the relationship with Israel, recognize them, and transfer the embassy to Jerusalem. That's essential. So that was the general context. I had more to say. I have more to say, but that, that was in general. I'm running out of time. Yes, sir. And we have questions already. Senator, thank you for your participation. Apologize to present it partially your resume. And he has published two papers in, uh, in indexed uh, magazines and many bills presented by you. And one is the fundamental human right to vote by the public force. And that will be another roundtable discussion. 
Now you have the floor, and I have questions for all of you, Dr. Useche and Senator and Dr. Cantila. Thank you very much. Professor Cancelado was my professor at CDNL, Integrated Defense Course. Yeah, he was my professor. Very brilliant, very brilliant professor. Okay, it's working. Yeah. Thank you very much. University Colonel uh, Pedro Rojas. It's a pleasure to be here in this. I consider my house because I've been here for many years and also share this. I'm pleased to share this panel with two important uh, people from our public life of our country. Now I'm going to present how we can get into the military diplomacy with an, an strategic view of the countries. And as Dr. Edgar said, we have a lot to say. But in general, why don't we see where are we in this military diplomacy in those countries of interest in this event? I had the freedom to write down this subtitle and his military diplomacy will be as a a tool for the cooperation on multilateral security. I think that through all the world history, empire, Japan empire surrender with Arthur MacArthur here, closing the, in the Second World War. And why I am taking this initial picture as reference? Because I want to start by something that's clear. And it is that, as it has been said, before, military and diplomacy are not different topics. I will dare to say, in general, that's like the egg and the chicken. What's first? Military or diplomacy? Of course, with the prof professionalization and the development of the states and the Western states, each takes divergent paths in the daily practice, and that makes, that's making that the military and the diplomacy that will take different lines, different agents that match permanently, permanently get together. Through the history, they go apart, then they get together. And from the ancient times, we can say those big diplomatic councils, they were all generals in the Middle Age who are signing the victories or defeats, like this picture here, military leaders, gentlemen. And there is a stray, a close relationship between both areas, but within the positive concept of the ever bureaucracy, we need to develop bureaucratic aspect differentiated by the complexity that implies contemporaneous diplomatic relationships. I imagine that was very easier to be the empire, the, the, the Roman emperor, emperor than to be the president. He was taking all the afternoon frees to go and share with friends. That was very simple. No, 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 a whole powerful empire. But to be the president today is more complex. International relationships are more complex. The international system is complex, and the complexity is around the military and the diplomatic space. So in that sense, let's take back as concept, not as practice, is clear that the practice is uh, not a way through history, but let's go back to the military diplomacy. This can be defined as a set of activities developed maybe by the representatives of the state, uh, the defense entities, state department, ministry of defense, any portfolio of this type, and any other state entities or defense department, sorry, in order to protect the interests of the states in the 
field of defense and politics based on the use of the negotiations and our diplomatic instruments. This is from Eric Pachinka from Slovenia, who has been working a lot with this. But during the 20th century and 21st century, some institutions appear that seem to mark a space of diplomacy parallel to what we consider the public one, proper of the chancellors and the ministries. And then we have some multilateral agreements that have been very strong and are strengthening more and more, like the case of the NATO, the counterpart of the Cold War that was part of Varsovia. Bar yeah. And we have internal ones of terms of na na defense and national security. And let's say that each multilateral agreement is adding the variable and who is in charge of managing the scenario of the diplomacy are some the military services, civil authorities and uniform men in charge of security and defense. And then will be appearing the concept of military diplomacy. And our concept used here in Colombia by Vicente Torrijos from the school, uh, College of War, diplomacy of defense is broader, but we're going to see why it can, be, it can be broader. There are three basic action lines, the military cooperation, and doctor was mentioning before that the taches are more than uh, missile sellers, and yes, he's right, but that's also uh, their proper space, and that's how it's been seen. And I uh, initially, it's always seen then, but they, it go, they go beyond a military cooperation that can be a tactical, operational, or even strategic cooperation. It can also be uh, one to the end of technology transfer, but not just in the military, but also projecting military to civil, civilian, because many inventions have come from the military world, impacting later the civilians. And our scenario is the cooperation proper of the states, and that's the political cooperation, and I have that here, and I'm going to explain you why. And the transfer of technology. That political cooperation is to disclose the values of the states. And besides the protection of the interests of the same through the diplomacy, to build multilateral networks of dialogue, promoting the creation of different blocks of interest. And what's a block of interest? Many professors, many from the academia and politicians today are using the new Cold War. The new Cold War. And the difference is that maybe we don't have the ideal for our own ideological concept of the Second World War, the post-war 20th century concepts, because we're not fighting against this uh, internationally, but we're fighting against the state capitalism, authoritarian capitalism, like China and all other freedom, more free like the ones that we have here in the Western part. But there is a fight of blocks. If we think in the international contemporary system, we're going to see that the world is divided by blocks. The Chinese block, and we say Russia and Iran, and then we say Turkey, and 2030 we lost Turkey from this part of the world with the coup d'etat, all the attempts of at this coup. And we go to Latin America who are in that block. Easily we can say Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, the largest embassy of Russia in Latin America is the one in Nicaragua. And we are not taking attention to that because Nicaragua is kind of in a crazy way trying to find political oppositors. And behind that, behind that, there is a portion of next tension due to the proximity to the other powers in the region. And in the other side, the other blocks, yeah, of course. Who would be the United States bloc? the NATO, the, you know, if you, uh, for the European Union, Latin America, and then they will say Colombia. So the world is divided by blocks, not marked ideological, but of interest. And that interest created for the defense from the multilateral, to defend from the multilateral. Why? Because the power reach so far, and the Second World War is the perfect example of that, the military and economic power developed by the world is so broad that it's not enough for one country by itself. It's not enough. 
is not uh, one country is not going to be able to make it around 1300 aircrafts around the world um around 3000 vessels making the united states a little power of high power but on the other side there are secondary powers that are going to equal in the middle term, not directly the same power. I think that one is going to have 13,000 uh, 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 fight, fight, fire aircraft, but strategically they can position in the international system. Then appears what we call the large uh, strategy from the English uh, capitalism that's leader hard, how the countries are moving in the international system through this big strategy. We have uh, Andre Bosse from France and the uh, German. So they're talking that there is a total strategy, a political strategy, the large strategy. I like more the approach of the French because there are four areas, the diplomatic, psychosocial, economic, and the military one within the general strategies. The thing is that the military strategy is not exhausted in the exclusive po uh, option of the operational, but it's part of the large strategy developed by the countries and helps to what Warfrey would call the total strategy or the large strategy. So in this analysis, we can uh, get over Clausewitz. Clausewitz leaves it more like the strategy, like a classic one, and the political apart, because uh, Clausewitz was taking a look to the continuity between the political and the military. Both free leader heart are putting them inside the military, the military inside the political part, and everything is going to a total strategy. So we cannot take away the military from how are just strategically, no, strategically is the countries are positioning in the international system. And I'm going to repeat, not just in the military, but also in the operational part. And what, why is it? Because there is a new context with new challenges, as Dr. Edward was saying, there is a transformation of the elements that are forcing to an adaptation and a transformation of the institution, which all of them, the military and the diplomatics, key from the contemporaneous world, geographically marked from historical events. As I was saying, we cannot we can talk about a new Cold War. What are we talking about today? The globalization, the internet, social media, and now the social media are the paradise of the propaganda. Why? Come, she did that theory because they studied the Nazis, and Nazis were the uh, magicians of propaganda. Yeah, they make up all the political market with large public uh, advertising deployment. And the quote of lie, 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 and from the lie, something will be left. And then it's hard to fix that up. So social media is doing the, the delicious of what's going on today. Well, the next one, the environment degradation, we're all using our mask. I don't think that there is much divide about what's going on with the environment and that zoonosis, uh, natural, uh, taking us more and more to different phenomena. They say this is the first of many. Let's say what history tells us. That in fast changes in the economy, the crisis of containers and vessels right now in the United States, crisis of products, trades, inputs, economy is growing, others decreasing, the economic transformation, the economic system. Products of the pandemic, yes, but China, for example, demographic evolution, hard to sustain, and the economic power you were mentioning, strategies based on the economy. And there is an important book here. World by other means. So, 
they talk about the economic part, the actions, the movements of the countries. And now, let's go. So how I am transforming That, 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 I'm sorry, um, I lost the mic. They're trying to fix it. I'm trying to take it from the venue. A state? No, es que no puedo. Okay, they added strategically militaries to reorganize the new international system of post-war. And who did that? The militaries did it. The militaries, especially, as I said, Japan, until they developed all the parliamentary stru structure to, 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 in 1947, two years after. Instead, what is needed is a military campaign described for the current challenges, terrorism, migration flows, state threats against security and the prosperity around the world. And then we are talking about development and economy. We cannot understand economy and development of one country or in a block of power without the participation of the militaries. And I think that the pandemic has to speed that up. Because who, logistically speaking, had all the capacities to support their countries to contain the pandemic, the military services of every country. And we're going to see that for the case of Israel. So to continue with this position in a new age of competition in the big potency, the United States needs to continue investing in the world and being committed with the growth of security and stability abroad. The first speech abroad done by Joe Biden, president, is to the NATO, and he said, the United States is back. Because you cannot conceive a United States diplomacy without the contents of the European Union and the NATO, because they are the main partners. And he has, they have partners in other areas, as we, but we cannot compare our influence and power capacity in the international system like the one of Great Britain, French, and France, and Germany. We work for this complex of security, the regional one here in Latin America. And same as the Marshall Plan done uh, with respect with the Soviet Union, with this effort to cooperate, to help. That needs to be done also to Africa and Latin America to leverage, uh, to shore areas that are in the United States and all the partners in Europe. This Colonel Ebitz, fellow of the uh, Brookings, Brookings Institute, and the military members are thinking strategically the movements and the projection of the United States for Israel. Appears the division of the international cooperation in the strategic planning of cooperation. Fortalece pues todo esta todo este escenario de la de la diplomacia militar, sí. And for them, that's inherent for the planning and the operational execution. So, okay, part of the whole operational exercise is tied, or I will say that military diplomacy is also tied in that exercise of the execution of operational planning and execution. Let's go to the all schemes of comprehensive action by 2013. That was what will be a non-kinetic effort the use of the military for the development and to strengthen the civilians' capacities, diplomacy in this case, excluded? No, no, you cannot exclude it because the services will, forces will do anything. Not one thing good, not the other. So it's a process of support. The uh, General Brigadier 
Defrin, uh, director of the Division of International Cooperation in Israel Army, they said that they have focused to cooperate with to achieve missions and different objectives. The force is trying to keep the operation preparation, acquiring medical equipment abroad and preserve the foreign relationship, all that avoiding the propagation of coronavirus. They were talk he was talking about that moment, precise. And why here Colombia developed the own operation, San Roque operation, and also supported that effort. That effort was coming from abroad. We needed to bring everything to support the civilians. We needed to develop new spaces of integrated comprehensive action. Therefore, the forces could support in a good way the civilian military relationship, specifically for coronavirus. So I was saying the pandemic speed this scenario up because when some of this is a catalyzer, pandemic was a catalyzer, geopolitical speaking of everything that could happen in the world in five years, speed it up to one year. So on the other hand, Colombia is a country that are permanent doing efforts to be more interracial, international in an effective manner as a relevant actor and with a sector of security and defense is not away from this effort. And that's the interest of different international actors in which Colombia with the military services forces already know and it's important for the current world in a stability for the so-called irregular threats that seem that have jacked and more in state, not as a concept, but also as a reality. So what do I mean with this for the Colombian case? Colombia, during 60 years in the last stage, developed uh, a lot of adaptations and capacities that the world needs because the world is transforming in this uh, conflict. And we abandoned the scenarios of war or third generation war and according to William Mint classification. So in some moment of time in a course here, I was saying, okay, Normandy type operations, we're not gonna see that anymore. That was back then for the 1944, but that not this necessarily means that the military need is not there and that they're not gonna be threats and that we don't need that. Uh, actions from the military pact, but those are the ones, the irregular threats. Today, there is just one regular threat with an option of a conflict, and that's Taiwan. But both powers are deeply being prudent because they know they don't want to fall in what Graham Mollison calls the trap of we are growing so, far, so much and we are being so powerful, we need to confront for the world power and more the Pacific Basin, and then uh, that first Japan, second will be China. But Colombia developed those capacities already. Colombia developed capacities, work capacities, but also diplomatic capacities to obtain to, uh, military diplomacy, to obtain aid, one of the most important plans, and that will continue forever in the military story, history, that's Plan Colombia. Foreign policy focus precisely to bring help to and a military effort to materialize those aids in, on a specific plans. And I want to finish right now with the quote that comes from Coronel Pedro Rojas in a, an article in El Tiempo. We are referent forces and we can share our expertise so other countries can confront in a better way the transnational threats and the organized crime. But also we need to broaden the spectrum of opportunities to acquire new capacities and training with teams and systems that will make us more interoperable, al uh, aligned with stand international standards and with a focus in the defense of sovereignty and the integrity of our territory, military diplomacy and the public dim diplomacy of the states is because it's a bridge and a door because it opens to take what the world needs from a country to a specific block, but also opens so we can bring what the country needs from the world, the cooperation and the partners. And that's all for my part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cancelada, for your 
talk. That makes me remember that there are some experts reassessing the judicial power, executive power, and legislative power, and instead include also the military power, religious power, and the private company power. That's an hour round table, but we have a question. Senator Palacio, how to minimize the attacks to the legitimacy of the military services through the networks and the media? And I would think the um, of, Minister of Defense in the social media presented something and everyone went over him. Other proposed to regulate the social process in the social media and he was silent. Uh, he, uh, what's your position about this? Let me see. Okay. The quote of the new enemies of the state is to use our democracy to finish the democracy. The strategy precisely is to be immune to any response from the state, not just in the military aspect, but in the media also, because as soon when you are in a democracy, in case that there is a tweet or some network delegitimating them, they will pray Okay, uh, because they call for the freedom of expression and the violation of their rights. And that's why it is very important, the education and the political culture. And that way, a state can be legitimate. Because my rights reach when to where yours starts. So I think that regulation helps, yes, but it's not the end solution. It will help, but also there needs to be a limit. And I'm going to be more radical here. The ideological limits need to be presented. Some doctrines that don't fit in a democratic state. Germany, for example. Germany, you may have some Nazi beliefs. Yes, the state is not going to be against your beliefs, but you cannot create a Nazi political party or a Nazi ideology with the pretext of democratic. And that has nothing to do with Petro. No, Petro fix like rock, that allows to create a party with a Nazi ideology because uh, in order that the, dem the democracy, in order to have reproduction of the democracy, you need the political parties. And that's important that you have this uh, rock clause that any that will replace the constitution on any reform, because there are some political proposals talking about having a new constitution, a new constituent from the legal vision that constitution is the base standard of the state. If you want to say change the state, you, as Chavez did, you change the constitution and then you centralize the power and you rule by decree. And that's uh, something that's going there, like a bill, but we need to block it. But they are attacking not just from the networks, but also from the legal and the political. And for that, we need to forbid and not just to limit to the limit in a democracy, because the democracy has limits. Your right starts when mine end. So that law or that bill needs to not allow or to forbid if that has to do with national security, cannot be authorized that it is an apology the legitimizing strategic sectors of the country that will affect the national security. It is not just to regulate the opinion. No, no, no. We need the open opinion in a democracy. It's better an overflowed press than one uh, that's better than press and an overflowed press that one control. Yeah, we need more freedom, more press, but there are limits to that and to the networks as an our expression of communication and the opinions where if the national security topics are being attacked, that requires to be banded. And we have the cyber defense uh, state, the technological capacity, and with Israel, who has advanced so much in those topics of the Western Triangle, I'm sorry, United States, Israel, and Colombia, geopolitically speaking, we are there. Europe, the, that depends in general from the North American one as a block. But the ideological limits need to be established to those ideas that affect the national security. Thank you, Senator. And this one is for Dr. Cancelado. What would be the projection of the power vocation uh, between Colombia and Israel in each region? And what would be the role for the military forces in each case? Yeah, excellent. 
I share that there are deep similarities among both countries, at least for the case of Colombia that we have gone through 1832 in re retiring, losing water, losing land, losing other things. The Nicole three in at Hagi Court were closed. So I think that the power vocation implies two things. And we don't need to explain everything that has been in Israel since 1948 up to today. I think in the former question they asked Palestine, Israel, and the attacks and the last questions. I think that there are two key elements. And first of all, to stand the ground, stand on the ground, to present your position. There have been some attempts from the operational, military operation, and as politologists, I believe that the attack to Raul Reyes in Ecuador, uh, that, that was a political message. The military is not political, no, cannot be electorate, but it's deeply political because the Colombian state has some values, and those values are political elements. So the military... As I mentioned before in my talk, military will help to expand and to consolidate the values that the state has. And in this case, if it's a democratic state, will be those values. And also we mentioned the Germans. The Lemons Bond was the expansion of the values from the Nazi military. What the Stalinism to expand that from the Soviet authoritarianism. So I think that first we need to keep, to keep, to stand some precedents, and then to start to cooperate with the region, uh, with a common agenda and, and a regional complex with blocks, like, for example, Colombia. Colombia is getting away from those international situations. I remember president from Costa Rica, he come when President Santos, can you help me? What? Well, I don't, we don't have anything to do there. Vocation of power. Sounds kind of <laughs> it is strange, but we need to have that vocation. Israel has proven that they kept, and whenever they could, they went to the offensive against their immediate enemies. And we think the Six Days War and these are historical examples. Two key elements where the military is deeply compromised. Currently, what is the greatest challenge of the Colombian Foreign Services? How can military attaches support in overcoming the challenges of an external service? Muchas gracias, Coronel. Thank you, colleague. Um, basically, I see several points from what we've dealt with with respect to the role of the state. And I believe that the foreign services of any state should be quite connected with all uh, all the agencies that make it up, the Foreign Service of Colombia is in, uh, commanded by the President of the Republic and through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, consists of many different parts. And particularly in this opportunity, there has been uh, the issue of a decree for institutional cooperation for security and defense. In that context, it's important to highlight that new di diplomats, <coughs> if in 200 years, we were educated classically under traditional diplomacy with elements that allow an ambassador or a consul to face a tradition in international relations. I believe that from all points of views, we are going through a unique moment in history where diplomats need to have the adequate competencies to interact with their peers worldwide through the use of technologies. And we're living through a very, very special time where all agents of the state must understand that we are all ambassadors of Colombia. Of course, in a sort of everyday meaning, but everything that you say today in terms of public di diplomacy is being used in social networks. As the senator was mentioning, we are living through a very special time. Como dice el profesor Cancelado. And as Professor Cancelado was saying, this has been accelerated the fact of having to react when facing a need 
that I believe is in inviting us all to create a cyber force of security. And if at any point in between the world wars, the Air Force was created to, in order to have technology with all the things that, uh, that, that it implies, I believe that we're going through times where we need to have the state intelligence in the brain of the state, which is uh, the, the, the for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that is integrated with all, so that we can defend against all the enemies of the nation. And under that consideration, I believe that diplomacy, dear Colonel, is the mechanism that precisely defines what Kofi Annan was saying, the first line of defense of the state. If it fails, uh, it's as the Americans say, we, when you only have one hammer, everything looks like a nail. So uh, we need to be very prudent, be very diplomatic in the future with the adequate skill sets. I'm going to ask the last question to Senator Palacio. And after uh, the senator, I will ask uh, Dr. Cancelado to close the event. Your question, my question will be, what is your opinion about the notion of post-truth? How can we prevent uh, decision-making based on post Truth. Uh, can you? What is your opinion on the concept of post truth? How can we um, avoid a, a discourse based on this on the conflict in Colombia? We were talking about post-democracy, post-truth, post-rational. And this is related precisely to crisis of absolutes. And this is part of post-modernity also. And, and we're also talking about post-democracy even, and the state has lost monopoly of the consensus, which has transferred into civil society. We see that in demonstrations now. So the state does not represent, and it turns it into a fragile and vulnerable state. So this notion of post-truth is within the context of post-modernity. Philosophically speaking, it's a, a sort of, uh, of fall down of, of Western rationality, after all these promises made by Kant or these notions that the rational man or rationality would lead, hum lead humanity to the prosperity of development and peace. And then came two world wars after the Enlightenment and the, then came First World War, Second World War, the Cold War, because that was not going to end. And then the issue of absolutes, the notion of absolutes and the birth of existentialism, which was the irrational, so to speak, a reaction to abs uh, rational absolutism that we had lived through. So post-truth, I believe, is one of the strategies. And for fourth and fifth generation warfare, but the, the, the question is, uh, history according to who? what they're doing with the Havana Accords and the centers of historical documentation. So what they said about history being written by the victors. Mm. And in the end, history is an interpretation. His history is history according to who? So there's a war within that postmodern uh, context. And then we, we, we see the creation of meta accounts. And that's how post-truth comes up. Then there are some micro accounts or micro Stories. Everyone is generating their own discourse and trying to represent their own identity and their selves. So I say, how can we prevent that from happening here? Well, there needs to be an official source. The state, I insist, the state cannot lose neither the monopoly, the monopoly of coercion or force, nor that of consensus. And so the historical memory must be written down by the armed forces, must be written down by the state. I mean. The political and the military, I don't know why they are stigmatized so much. I mean, if, 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 without army, there is no state. 
I mean, what is the independence of war, of countries? War. States are born from war to wage warfare constantly. So the, the military cannot be separated from the politics. And, and it's a de facto issue. So who is it that writes down history? Who needs to create the accounts? Who must the state trust? Or otherwise, who can we trust? We have no other choice. Let us disappear this mentally. So let's do the exercise. There's no state. Okay, so who has the truth? Who will guarantee rights and freedoms and liberties for all? It would be a war of everyone up against everyone. And there would be no way of going about it. And so I insist that there needs to be a, a strong state within a democracy, but a strong state. And it is the state that must create the official account, our armed forces, that we're in a war against the terrorists, should write the history of the country and tell us how it is that it happened. But for that, society has to, to impose its position. Dr. Cancelado, a minute for closing, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the university generals and the such great honor of being here with you with such important speakers and panelists as we had now and this morning. Dr. Cancelado, please. Thank you, Colonel. I believe there are two I iconic moments in the last few years for Colombia specifically, and which have to do with what we've been talking about with, uh, with respect to multilateral spaces. And then the first one, undoubtedly, and this we will have in history for a long time, is September 11. September 11 helped show the world that this scenario of transnational threats, of global terrorism, is able to do whatever. And then we see the reforms of NATO in 2009, 2010, which is thanks to that opening and understanding of NATO. It's not that they're changing, it's not that they're expanding their partners, but it just starts understanding that it needs to create alliances that are peripheral also. That it needs to have eyes and ears in all the international system. That is where Colombia also can tap into that. And in 2018, we become strategic partners. So I believe that the notion of the title of challenges and opportunities for Colombia and NATO allies is perfect because what we continue to analyze here are the challenges, but we are not alone. Colombia has understood that its problem does not begin, nor does it end in Cauca, Caqueta, or Janos regions. It could go around the world, and we're seeing it increasingly with the transnational threats that we have from of different nature, from drug traffic to terrorism, as was pointed out here, and as we've, we've already had started receiving... Uh, foreign actors that we didn't even know about before. So these spaces for academic reflection are the ones that allow us to sit down and particularly start shedding off the fear of talking about uh, allies, of talking about Colombia in their international setting, particularly for those that are not within public diplomacy, because that is uh, the, the setting of public diplomacy. But we also need for diplomacy to show us that there's a whole world to conquer in terms of, in diplomatic terms. And this diplomatic includes the institutional, and I believe that all these efforts are very valuable because that's where reflection starts that could eventually develop a whole line of thinking for the country. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you, Professor Cancellato. And uh, thank you, Senator. I would like to perhaps uh, give you some uh, reflections from my experience in Boston, quite removed uh, from, from everyone and, and just de devoted to reading. And this is a message to all people who want to be leaders in Colombia, starting with our soldiers. This reflection is done for whoever wants to climb Everest or Chimborazo in Colombia, two of the highest mountains in the world. And is the idea that the more you climb, the more you descend. And I am referring to one of the phrases of Colin Powell uh, to the, the person who was my dean. And it's about humility. If you want to lead a country, a region or the world, you start by leading yourself and you start by doing introspective work to be able to then lead others. Others, Thank you. Well, thank you. This has been an extraordinary panel, absolutely disruptive, particularly the strategic thinking of the senator, and of course, Henry, 
I will not say, name the academy director because he is in government, so he cannot participate on that. But we've come to reflect upon many different things, and these are topics that are, are important to reflect upon. And these are stances that we need to be clear about in our context as a nation that is geographically privileged, but that has the world's eyes on it. I want to salute Victor Alejandro Reynolds Lopez uh, from the Ministry of Interior. Thank you, sir, for coming here. And closing, I want to thank Colonel Fernando Barrero Chavez for moderating this panel. Colonel, thank you. You are always welcome. This is your home, your brother, a colleague in arms, and we have been very pleased to have you here. Please, a round of applause for Colonel Barrero. And uh, I want to enclose, I want to invite General Gustavo Adolfo Calpo Nadar, Director of the Geostrategical and Political Affairs of the University of Nueva Granada, who will briefly address you to close this panel today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here again. Uh, kind readings to all. As a director of the Geostrategic Studies Center and on behalf of Brigadier General Luis Fernando Puentes Torres, I want to thank you for your presence in these three wonderful days. The Granadina community and all the people who have accompanied us from the Army, the National Police, our Air Force has been present, officers, non-commissioned officers, teachers of our military university, both in person and online. Each of the members and internal and external of officials of the dean's office of uh, law and international relations. We always had General Robinson here with us and Major Dusan, the vice deans, and all the students and the body of generals and admirals. I, I we also had the participation of Admiral. Jesus Alvarez. We've had great participation from the Granadina community, from other institutions, and quite a presence online from the different academies. Uh, the professors that have participated today, both national and international, have engaged the interest of their students who have been logged in. And uh, Colonel Pedro Rojas, thank you for this great preparation of this symposium and for organi your organization you know as organizers that this type of activities are not easily organized in this case a, a, a hybrid thing uh, both virtual and in person which requires significant effort from a technical group at our university of which our director of educational resources aurora along with her team, who are always behind the stage or behind the scenes, are uh, making this possible, making the live broadcast possible, and even with all the circumstances and obstacles 
things go well. So these three wonderful days leave us lots of learned lessons. And if you will allow me, I want to thank Dr. Ofra Gris here uh, from our great sister nation, Israel, for her presence these three days. Lieutenant Colonel James Graham, James Green, Lieutenant Colonel Grant Martin, Professor Michelle Mastroni, Dr. Edgar Palacio, Miraji, that would be uh, Mr. Ruben Useche, Colonel Fernando Barrero, and in this last day we also had the Professor Peckle. Ruben Useche, who leads an important academy of our former minister, Augusto Ramirez Ocampo. My father is a relative of Augusto Ramirez Ocampo. His mother was Mariela Ocampo. So I, I really like it when you are here. It brings good memories, good family memories, sir. Um, Also, Professor Henry Cancelado, quite renowned in the academic environment and in our school of warfare, as uh, Colonel Pedro Rojas was saying, he's a professor. He was a professor of our dear senator here and a professor of many different generations of the military. And uh, this gives for a great indication of what you are and what you represent. So in that sense, now we'll be brief. I will give you no more lectures. So in the first day, with the, in, in the opening of the symposium, we gathered, we had uh, the academic community headed by the president. He could not be here because of other activities as, uh, as president of the university, but he did give us some opening words for this important event. And... And in respect to the presentation of Ms. Grace here, Colombia military thinking from an Israeli perspective, a critical and disruptive perspective, she first presented the uh, operational design system from Israel, its advantages, and the way that it has molded the Israeli uh, uh, military doctrine. She also showed us some elements of disruptive thinking. And uh, I, as we know, Colonel Rojas loved that. He always tells us, and we were in discussion activities, he always emphasizes uh, on trying to make us think a little bit more, and that's always very important. What must be taken into account in the tactical, operational, and strategic designs? Having left uh, this Israeli model clear, Professor Grisier applied this in the military context of the Colombian Armed Forces showing their vulnerabilities, but also stressing on the strengths of the country. Finally, Professor Greaser did an analogy of Israel and Colombia as countries that are targeted by terrorism, by irregular warfare, by irregular armed groups, and its implications in the design of the national strategy, focusing of course, on the activities of Israel in the region. In the second day, Professor Ofra Grazer would give us a great presentation again, now uh, called Current Challenges for the Israel Defense Forces from an uh, operational design perspective. During this presentation, she starts by showing the way in which the international political environment affects implementation of the operational design of the Israeli Defense Forces, emphasizing on the political change in the United States, the Western weakness, the weakness of certain international organizations, the fatigue of the nation state, and even moral fatigue. 
Thus, having explained this, she managed to give us a dimension of the of international actions of Israel, whether in its relations with Israel, with the West as well as with other political blocs, as Russia and China, as well as with other threats of a hybrid nature. In a very interesting case, there's a case with Azerbaijan showing how changing international policies are always showing the interests and the interests of its rivals. And the second, uh, Colonel James Green presented the challenge, the, the presentation challenges for implementation of the potential perspectives for the National Kowamen Army. In this presentation, Colonel Greer showed the challenges for operational design. Among these challenges, he talks about the origin of the strategy, design thinking, the methodology of military thinking, and the design of military education. In conclusion, the Colonel's presentation gave us a perspective on operational design and the way in which this should be thought about, which gives us an efficient method for operations design in the, on the battlefield. And third, Lieutenant Colonel Grant Martin presented a dissertation on the operational design from the U.S. perspective, where he included a dichotomy between irregular and regular warfare. With these concepts, Colonel Greer considered that operational design needs to take into account the ways of doing warfare and designing strategic and making strategic designs that can really have a positive impact on war. As an, a main example, there's the conflict of Afghanistan that this officer was uh, involved in and he participated there, but where there was no clear integration of the disruptive kind of thinking that we want to have in this kind of wars. Finally, we had a presentation of Dr. Michel Mastroni with his presentation, the tension between organic design and the methods of established design. The professor, Canadian, uh, presented his research that seeks to consolidate an effective operational design for the Canadian Armed Forces and organic designs. To achieve this, he seeks to integrate international experiences of Israel and the U.S. However, he quite emphasizes on the need to integrate the elements of each of the countries in formulating these designs. In conclusion, he presents his design as one more to be considered, but he always recommends thinking about the fact that design could improve or impact Colombia. Third day. Uh, Professor Peckel analyzed the uh, political triangle between Colombia, Israel, and the United States, big allies. In this presentation, the professor showed us how the three mentioned states, despite the fact that there is no consolidated alliance as such, he showed that the three states implicitly have their own interests that bring them together and create an adequate relationship of alliance. Among these commonalities is terrorism, whether from uh, the Colombian armed group, drug traffic, or the, or the enemies that have affected Israel and the United States. And thus he concluded that the coming closer of these three countries allows for activities, uh, joint activities against these threats. Afterwards came uh, Dr. Oprah Grazer in her presentation, Israel and Colombia Perspective as NATO Global Partners. She analyzed NATO as a whole, using Israel and Colombia as the main actors in the failing of this macro alli alliance of, of nations. In this critique, we can see an uh, open rejection of the use of war, despite the fact of situations such as that of uh, Belarus and uh, the situation of the United States as the hegemonic leader of NATO, all leading to a tension between the national interests of leading NATO states or, and, and, and Colombia and Israel. The NATO winning, so to speak, many of these discussions. In that sense, Professor Grazier considers that these alliances must always be, we must always be cautious about it, never lose identity with respect to that. And then came Dr. Ruben Usecher talking about 
civil and military relations and the accelerator of Colombian diplomacy. He does a judicious study of the way in which arms and diplomacy interlink in the development of foreign policy of the countries, particularly Colombia, emphasizing on the work of military attaches as a first point of uh, foreign policy and a first tour on what the role of the military has been in diplomacy. He especially stressed out the fact that military attaches are vital in the multiplication of the diplomatic role in our country. According to him, the development of the military relations with other countries becomes an essential element for regional international presence. Colombia has proved to be a point of encounter for training and development of highly desirable military activities for others, other countries, and that is why it has become an actor to be kept in mind. And we then continue with a presentation from our Senator Edgar Palacios and his presentation relations between Israel and Colombia in the geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geostrategical context. In this conference, the Senator compared the cases of Israel in Colombia based on the concept of, of fourth and fifth generation warfare with non-military actors that seek to delegitimize other actors, as we've seen lately. That is why both nations must seek to exercise their sovereignty, acting against such actors, cooperating and using military diplomacy and political diplomacy to support that. Finally, we had the presentation of Henry Cancelado, who presented about the importance of military diplomacy in the projection of national power, the cases of Israel, the United States, and Colombia. In this presentation, we heard that the Colombian state must always take into account within its national strategy the use of military exercise, whether through military diplomacy and for the strengthening of relations with other countries, whether regionally or with remote countries that have similar elements or concepts such as Israel. He also considers that the study of the military strategy must always be considered in the preparation of a national strategy. That, based on what has been described by both in Lee and Heron Klausowitz, uh, in all that to be able to react to the events that are taking place in the world currently. It is true, true that we have had three great days of contributions, of concept learning, and I want to thank Archipelago of Design for their great role in making this come true. Uh, Dr. Philippe Devon, uh, not, he has not been able to attend in person, but he has been online because of some health condition, but as he was saying, or uh, uh, sorry, as Churchill uh, was used to say, not so few people did so much for so many. So the truth is, our military throughout their history in each of their decades and contexts that they have to live under have been strong and have, uh, and have always been part of, of meritory and honorable acts. They have always written their story with honor and with their own blood. And the defense of Colombian democracy for that, my greatest respects to all the generations of the military throughout Colombian history, to the Colombian soldier, to, um, to non-commissioned officers and officers uh, and generals, all essential to preserve Colombian democracy. They have always worked, uh, striven to build and to help her country never fall in the hands of communism. Do not lose democracy ever. And these academic exercises are extremely significant. And we pose questions. And as you saw, some of the questions came from the students. And perhaps some of them are inconvenient or uncomfortable because of the questioning uh, the, the intention. But this is the academia. And this helps us mature and ripen the uh, thinking of the students. So I am very proud of having had this event. We have Luis Fernando Puentes Torres, our president, 
who I will now hand the floor to. Um, please show your face, General, and a big round of applause for the General. We have a minute of silence and the anthem of the university, is that correct? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and I apologize for not having been able to attend in this event, this closing event, because for us, this academic event that we are finishing today is very important. Those of us who had the opportunity of being present in the opening day on Monday realized or we, or we wanted, we announced that this event is part of the launch of our strategic thinking school. A project of this administration that seeks to generate to build on the Institute of Geopolitical Studies that we already have in place. That is why this event, amidst the pandemic, and with a great effort put forth, particularly by our allied company, it's a multi-country company, it was born in Canada, but it currently has members around the globe, and Latin America has become a part of this conglomerate that AOD is, is conforming. And this gives for special importance, relevance with respect to what we want to achieve, to create this strategic thinking school and the school of governance and leadership. We knew that it was very hard to bring in all the people that we would have wanted to bring in. We tried to have quite a selected audience. We had some people from the School of War, for some others from the General Command. The Air Force was all the time with us, and in fact, with a representative from the General Corps and, uh, or um, a consulting general. And I believe that we, we have fulfilled our objectives. The fact that Dr. Ofra Grazier, who, was, who attended the event in full, who belongs to the board of a AOD, and the fact that she could share all her knowledge with us with respect to the operational arts and design was very valuable for us. Undoubtedly, gaining this perspective of uh, of generals from Israel who have some aspects in their story that are very similar to ours, the time of, of struggle. She was giving us a great comparison yesterday when she said that we are both islands amidst a, a, a hurricane, a, a turmoil of violence. And it is true. It's the truth. Um, with due proportions, the truth is we are both on the eye of the hurricane. For us, it's very important to see how Israel generals and the Israeli forces 
have evolved on the planning of operational arts, operational design, and we are learning. That's what's important about this event. This school of strategic thinking wants to do exactly that, not only to prepare our officers, but anyone who thinks that operational arts and design, that the strategic design, which is uh, one of our main outputs, in fact, when we go to other conferences and they say, see that we're in the military, they tell us, you have something that we may never want to have without wanting to stigmatize. You have something that we will never have. You have it in your, it's your doctrine. You are, since a very early age, you are within an environment of doctrine and you fully respect it and follow it. As said by a presenter we had in the G said uh, the university is not part of the G said but I was there and he was one of the main speakers and um, it quite called my attention and I was then interacting with him and he has no link whatsoever to the military and he said I've always admired your discipline the way that you do things you're planning but that every day it is a changing doctrine we have Colonel Pedro Rojas here an expert on that topic and who had to manage the change of doctrine in the army which is being copied by our brothers and sisters from the Air Force and the Navy I want to thank Ofra very specially from the heart your trip to come here and talk about your experience. We met back in Canada in an event uh, in 2017, the first AOD event, I think. Since then, I admired you. I know that you are a soldier, an exemplary soldier, and an institutional reference. And what you have taught us in these sessions is invaluable opera with my greatest embrace from the heart thank you so much and we hope that you can consider colombia your second home thank you so much we were uh, colleagues back in canada i also want to thank honorable senator who is also of Jewish ascent and uh, as a senator, a candidate they were for the presidency and who is close to the military. Honorable Senator, and to those who support you, and uh, also to Mr. Usecha, Director. It's not called Diplomatic Academy anymore, right? Uh, it's, like a, it's Diplomatic Academy, Augusto Ramirez Ocampo. Okay, so we knew it as San Carlos uh, Diplomatic Academy. Now it is called Ramirez Ocampo Diplomatic Academy, one of our distinguished diplomats who has just and, and Uceche, Mr. Uceche, you know you have a strategic ally in the university. It's an honor to have you here with us. And to all of you, I want you to take the best memories of the military university. We know we will continue to meet in this academic setting because it's an everyday uh, road and journey, and we're here by your side, working for a better tomorrow, for something that we can leave our children so that they can truly say we left a valuable legacy, not as it happens oftentimes and as it has is happening in these chill times. Maybe that notion of, of, of thinking that I could have done better and I didn't. So this is a part of that. This is part of this training that we are living 
for those who will go after us. The military university has that motto. We need to keep the flame burning, the torch, which is the conveyance of knowledge and wisdom. I will not talk about something, drill on something that will uh, be excessive perhaps, but we will be op uh, opening a, a statue in Kahika branch or the Kahika campus of the university. Is that statue? This was not prepared. I had not prepared to show you that. But this is the, the transmission of, of knowledge between generations. It's uh, American sculptor Anne Wyatt Huntington gave it as a present to General Franco after the Spanish Civil War, and he ordered to put it in the main square of Complutense University of Madrid. And it's quite imposing. It's eight meters, 8.5 meters tall, and it's a marble statue. We are going to create a replica of that in the military university. The graduates, of which I'm part, We'll leave this as a legacy for the new granite in the generations. Possibly next year you will be finding about this uncovering of this uh, sculpture. It's two Spartan warriors, one agonizing in his last breath, dying breath, and passing the torch to another Spartan warrior. This is no exception. They were always naked. But this guy is riding a horse that represents technology, knowledge, innovation, and he, and the guy who is down is passing the torch of wisdom. So that's what I'm telling you. We need to keep the flame alive, and we need to convey this to the next generations. Thank you very much to all those who attended. It's been a true pleasure. And we hope that when we have the new building in place as a, a acquired by the university four blocks from here, we hope we will have our School of Strategic Thinking, the Nueva Granada School, with that purpose. And that is was the purpose of this event, the main event of many with this purpose. Special greetings, Oprah, to the president of AOD, Philippe Dufort, and uh, Vice President Philippe Dulu, or um, I, I know they are with us from the distance, but we feel their presence at heart, and we know and hope that very soon we will have them here helping us convey this doctrine of AOD to this young people who will eventually relieve us and who will become the leaders, the future leaders of our country. You can afford the luxury of saying, I prepared, I helped prepare these Colombian leaders that will end up running the country, will end up having the responsibility of directing the fates of this great nation. God bless you all. Thank you very much. I wish you all great luck and the best of success.